And I love haters because they will boost the algorithms, <laughs> please comment <laughs> on my post. I love you guys, you know. I actually need a massage right now. That would be good. <laughs> and it, it really impacts the younger generation, like ourselves. Okay, probably like themselves. <laughs> <laughs>
who might be in distress or struggling with mental conditions. I'm doing this research assistant job where I am diagnosing people. Sometimes when I am conducting the interviews, I find myself like really surprised that there are people who actually do not exhibit any form of symptoms at all. And whereas on the other spectrum of people, they are not able to get off bed, they are stuck in the Institute of Mental Health, for example, you know, just, so those are like the two kind of spectrums that I see. A lot of us are into fit sport, right? Like having a healthy body, gymming and all that, uh, that's very important. But I think we often neglect our mental well-being for the pursuit of our career or even our education. When you talked about fit spo, right? The yeah. first person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Because, yeah, <laughs> no, but, he has totally... a TikTok channel about fitness, oh, yeah. yes. But I totally agree with what he says because like, if you're not in a good state of mind, forget about your physical. Yeah. It's like a domino effect. It's, it will definitely affect your physical. No matter how hard you work out, it's just, it's not going to really solve the root. So the root is actually the mind. What are some things that affect a person's mental health? Things like stress, stress, mm. emotion, overthinking, you name it, it will affect your state of your mind. There are different kinds of stresses. Like for example, during COVID, there was like, like a lot of isolation, right? Because of that, there's a lot of social withdrawal. There's a lot of anxiety uh, due to the uncertainty about the future. Yeah, I, I see Nikki nodding. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Still uncertain. Yeah, because it's very uncertain, right? Yeah, so these are certain stresses that will actually lead to uh, a spiral in terms of mental well-being related issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at the current student here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 What do you think of your future? <laughs> uh, I, def I definitely agree. Um, yes, there is some form of uncertainty that I feel when I'm looking at the future. But I think for me, it's really about your interpretation of the event itself that contributes to the onset of symptoms. So it's how we're able to process our emotions it's uh, psychology, in yeah. the context yeah. of that situation. I mean, I don't have a psychology background personally, but I, I believe in like the, the course I, I went and also when I practiced, I, I felt it for myself. Every mm. day we all have some form of stress, but it's how we respond, react and manage to those thoughts, emotions that will determine whether are you just going to be sad or are you going to mm. like, hey, keep moving forward towards like where you want to go. And just now what Hazika mentioned in social work and psychology, there's this term called reframing. It's very important to actually um, reframe, you know, your thinking and your emotions when you are down and all that because it really helps you to build that kind of resilience which you need. In your opinion, right, how important do Singaporeans think mental health is? If let's say we use a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not important and 10 being very important. I think 6 to 7. I think it really depends on the group of Singaporeans that we're looking at. The older generation of people, they may still hold very conservative views towards mental health, whereas the more younger generation may be more open to about mental health and seeking treatment and all that. Generally, the younger Singaporeans, like those Gen Zs below 25 years old, the perception or towards people around them who struggle with mental conditions are better. But when it comes to themselves, whether or not uh, they would actually disclose that they might have a condition and they really need help, then that will be lower. It's quite a contrast when you see that uh, you are able to actually show empathy towards people around you who might be struggling with mental conditions. And when it comes mm -hmm. to that happening to ourselves, uh, we tend to actually be more unforgiving. It might seem like a taboo, mm. you know, to mm -hmm. discuss. If you share on social media, people might see it as you're weak, you know, this kind of thing. So, yeah, but, but I do believe people know, and young or old, I think we know the importance of uh, mental health. This leads to the next question. How open do you think people are with seeking professional help for their mental health issues in Singapore? There's also statistics on this. We can state the stats first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's state the statistics the... first. <laughs> the top three mental conditions in Singapore uh, is actually depression first, uh, and then of course second, OCD. Third is alcohol disorders. So Samaritans of Singapore, one of the social service agencies, found out that about one third of Singaporeans uh, would actually go and seek help when they struggle with mental conditions. There's growing awareness, but I think more can be done in terms of promoting help-seeking behaviour now that they are more aware of these conditions. Based on the Singapore Mental Health Study, um, there is a significant number of um, people who are diagnosed. They take a considerable amount of time to like really go forward to seeking help. Um, the treatment gap for OCD is 11 years, mm -hmm. which means that someone who is diagnosed with OCD would take 
uh, about 11 years to come forward to seek help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you all think there is such a stigma around help-seeking behaviours? We care so much what people think of us, how they judge us. Yeah. That is like normal, you know. That's why people will be like, okay, I will just keep it to myself. And when it's too late, then, you know, it's a bit hard to share, really. Which is right, because uh, face value is very important, right? And now it's the day of social media. I have to really manage my how I see social media. Irony, right? I create a lot of content, but I don't consume a lot of social media. You can manage it, it's gonna give you a lot of you know benefit. At the same time, if you don't know how to use it, that will get into your head. Like, well, how come I'm like lacking behind? Why people are doing so well, you are not doing well? Because only people are only showing the wins, you know. So that's why I think you have to use wisely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom. Yeah. I think a lot of people. They are able to extend the help to others, but when they have it themselves, they kind of like beat themselves over it. It's, it's really tied to the notion that they view mental health as a form of weakness, a personal failure. In Singapore, we really emphasise a lot on achievement, yeah. success. As a nation, our success narrative is really doing well in our careers, so, you know, getting street ease or scholarship in our education and all that, and it, it really impacts the younger generation like ourselves. Okay, probably like themselves. Yeah, so I think these are all contributing to discrimination and stigmatization, and that's why it hinders people from seeking help. It, it sounds like it boils down to how much value you put in other people's judgment of yourself, right? It's, it's very easier said than done. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care what you say. You know, yeah, you can yeah. say it. But like, deep down, you care. You can right? say it verbally, 100%. but deep down, you know. So you cannot just use the word like easily. Just like solving any other problems in life, you have to find what is the root cause. When you are discussing about mental health with your loved ones, for example, how open do you think Singaporeans are? For use, it is actually proven that first people they go to is actually their peers, their friends. Second would be their parents. Third, you would have your teachers, your educators, and then the last few are the helping professionals, like your psychologists, oh. your counsellors. Yeah, that make... sounds ironic. <laughs> that, that's ironic, right? Yeah. yeah. From my personal experience, like, you know, my friends going through hardship, they will come to me. Mm. Or if I'm facing some things that I can't handle on my own, I will let them know first. So I totally agree with you. Yeah, so it's really important, right, to actually train you know, our friends, our peers, we or even our family members. Other. Yeah, with the relevant knowledge and peer support skills. Mental health first aid uh, responders so that they are better equipped to support themselves and their friends or their loved ones when they are in distress. So how, how would one approach, let's say, someone with suicidal tendencies or any other mm. self-harm? There are certain protocols. There. So the first one is check in with them to see whether or not they have any uh, suicidal plans. There's this myth that, you know, if you ask someone, then you will actually plant that thought in their mind. But research has actually shown that uh, that is not true. That is to actually ascertain whether or not uh, the person really has a plan. And if, let's say, the person says that he or she has a concrete plan, you can check in with them to see if they are actually open to go and seek help. SOS or IMH. Both of these agencies or institutions, they have a 24-7 hotline. However, if, let's say, they are already going to do that act, then call uh, 995. The third step would be to actually alert their family members, the next of kin, or anyone who uh, takes care of them or their caregivers and stuff. Studies have shown that mental health problems are on the rise for youths. Uh, what do you think is causing it? You have to live up to society's expectation, and that is escalated through social media. Like, you know, before that, maybe when there's no social media, it's just what your parents expect, what your family expect. But now it's like, then you have a lot of pressure that is like created by yourself by looking at what society or value of success or how you should be living your life. That if you're not nowhere near that, you will start judging yourself like for the youth, especially because youth use social media like everywhere, so. I think I'm also interested to know like, because um, you have started out uh, your well, career and yeah. your passion uh, in TikTok, right? Yeah. Have there been instances where you're like, oh shit, this is too much for me? Oh, de definitely, yeah. It's like a constant learning, you know, you are like constantly, re you recalibrate and then keep moving forward. So at the start, I feel the pressure, like what people think of me. I get maybe affected by the comments, but as I do it more, I, I don't really give a shit really. I'm working towards it, I'm very clear that I do what I need to do, if you're not on the boat, it's okay. I move on. I, I love haters because they will boost the algorithm. So I really love haters. Like, please comment <laughs> on my post. I love you guys. You know, so like, something like that. So, wow. so that's how you see. But I think it's really perspective. And 
and that the main thing is you must know that you cannot please everyone. Mm. I gotta ask the experts here is is he doing a very good job at reframing? Is that reframing? Is that reframing? Yes, you love your haters. Yeah, it is. Okay, what are some common issues that you struggle a lot with? The, the more common ones that our youth share with us are relationships. So, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> boy-girl relationships, family relationships, yeah. Uh, a lot of times they don't really know how to actually manage their emotions. Some youth-related suicides and social-emotional related issues are because these emotions are not uh, well managed. Then of course, academic pressure. There's a lot of competition. I can totally relate. Already, I'm like canning ahead five years time. All the internships I have to take, you know, that yeah, I totally relate. Yes. You plan five years ahead. ahead. <laughs> That's how Singapore plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we then help uh, to actually create that kind of uh, culture among Singaporeans that sometimes we need to take a step back to actually progress forward. All right, we're going to go into this interesting segment called Fact or Cap. So you have in your hands the green and pink petals. I'll be reading out some statements. If you think that statement is a fact, raise your green petal. If you think it is cap, raise the pink side. All right, ready? Let's do it, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's begin. So the first one, mental health problems are very common, fact or cap? It is a fact. Yes, we all are in agreement. What are some things someone can do to feel better if let's say you're having a bad mental health day? One of them is really having a good diet and also a good exercise regime. Sufficient rest is also very important. And then of course, community support is important. Uh, having you know a close group of friends, uh, family members, uh, classmates or even colleagues who are there to actually support you and of course hobbies, things that you enjoy doing. I'm going through a very stressful period of time. Uh, one of my favourite things to do is that um, I play the concert videos on YouTube and I just dance around in my room. And you know that just moving my body, like, it's a form of like fitness as well. It just really helps me to like release all the tension. For me, I don't use like external things to help me to de-stress. For me, what I practice is mindfulness. So basically, uh, you have to do a lot of uh, reflection. I tell myself, okay, I did what I can. Some things out of my control. So then I become less at attached to this uh, unfortunate outcome. How does one process negative emotions? Uh, maybe like, can, can go through, for example, like fitness activities such as running to um, process emotion. Because when I go for runs, I do think back about the issues that I'm going through and it as a form of a channel to really process. Other ways include like, um, mindfulness, yoga, or journaling. You channel the emotions to a healthier place. You don't just keep it bottled up inside, yeah. I think typically for an Asian society, we often hear like, oh, you know, don't cry. Don't be sad. People will say like, you, can, you know, you can just step out of it, right? Uh, Is that step... true? No, no, as in like, these are some things you shouldn't say to someone yeah. who's in distress or struggling with my just step out of it. Yeah, you, just, me, you, know, you know, just step out of it. It's all mind over matter. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not mind over matter. <laughs> it's easier said than done, Yeah, right? it's easier said than done. done. Yeah, so there are certain steps that you can take to actually help, you know, uh, support your friends better. And this is through active listening. You can start to ask open questions. Like for example, you know, you're not your usual self. You haven't been eating well, sleeping well, right? So, would you like to share more with me? But don't ask like close questions where it's a yes or no. Are you feeling okay? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they don't sort of like phone say, yeah, don't, don't stop them. No. Yeah, then it will stop the conversation, right? But of course, try not to lecture the person or give advice that the person doesn't even need because people don't really care how much you know, but really they care how much you care. The next one, therapy is only for people with mental illness. Fact or cap? So how would one decide if they need therapy or not? Usually in Singapore, uh, people will only seek a mental professional when they suspect that they have a condition. But I have friends around me who do not struggle with any mental related issues but they just need someone to talk to. Yeah, if you need it, just go for it. There's nothing to be ashamed. And when you know you, you, you have a sickness in that area, you just go and see that professional. Because Singapore, right, everything costs. <laughs> and we know that <laughs> okay. going to therapy, going for counselling, it costs money as well. So what, what can one do if, you know, the person just cannot 
afford. For the public hospitals, usually they would have a medical social work department. You can also go to polyclinics and then from there they will actually make a referral to the hospital. It can be IMH or it can be other hospitals that have a psychiatric department. Uh, apart from that, of course, healthcare agencies and social service agencies, they do provide all these complementary services. And if you need peer support, you can come to us at Campusai and all that. The next one, you can handle mental health problems on your own. Fact or cap? Is it half half? Is it half half? <laughs> <laughs> there are certain times where uh, you can handle it on your own, right? Mm. But when it becomes a condition where you become dysfunction in terms of your daily living, then that, that is the time where you actually need to go and seek help. What can I do if I suspect that someone is going through some mental health struggles? My advice would be to really just check in on the person. Mm. Even though it seems like a very minor thing, right? It can it's very significant to the person. Mm. Yeah, especially mm. as if the person is socially withdrawing from others, it really makes a difference. And checking in doesn't always have to be like, how are you? You know, you can, you can just send <laughs> a gift or ask the person out for lunch. I could just send the person TikTok videos or those kind of yeah, funny things. Yes. Do you send phones, uh, <laughs> TikTok videos? I, I will probably send those kind of animal videos. <laughs> I mean, I love animal videos, cute videos. There are times when uh, the person you are checking in, they are not open uh, to actually share their struggles because they need some time to process their emotions or their thoughts. What you can do is that you can let the person know that we understand that you need some time when you are ready. Feel free to let me know. Yeah. People with mental health problems can function normally at work. Fact or cap? For mental health, there's really a degree because there is a category of people who are really high functioning that are able to be productive and produce um, results and all that but inside they may be going through some internal struggle. There's nothing you can do to prevent mental health struggles. Fact or cap? What's your, what's your dilemma? Uh, let me think about it. You can ask them first. Oh, okay. <laughs> For me, I always believe you can do the best out of your given situation. Mm. Like that friend of mine. For him, it's biological or something like that. So I just thought, whoa, really? Like depression is like... Genetic. Genetics? Like, wow. Actually, I was just processing while he was talking. Uh, it should be uh, half. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, because there's a nature-nurture part. Nature meaning it's genetically disposition. Nurture part is when the environment plays a huge part in terms of influencing you. There are a lot of things that you can actually do in terms of preventing it, but if genetically you are dispositioned with that, chances of you getting it, it's actually higher. I feel like just because you're going to be higher likelihood of being going through this difficulty, I feel that you shouldn't take a very defeatist approach. Mm. It, has, it shouldn't like stop you from having a rich and meaningful life. If I know that, let's say, oh, uh, my parents or my grandparents has schizophrenia, what are some actions one can take to improve that mental wellness? I would recommend the person to really read up a lot. There's a lot of self-help books to really provide you with the resources and the knowledge about mental health. And I also want to recommend mindfulness. A lot of influences on the brain as well as psychologizing impacts that really does help you a lot. And like, yeah, phone. <laughs> yeah, really mindfulness helped me a lot. Be mindful me be present at any moment. If I'm doing nothing, just say standing on the MRT, I will just mm. focus on my breathing, having awareness that the air is entering, touching the tip of my nose as I inhale. Your mind will always travel everywhere, but it's okay, bring it back. Then a while later, it will pull you to the other direction, then you bring it back. As you play the game more, at the top of the wall, you'll get better and better at be more present and mindful, and that's gonna really keep your mind very clear and when you achieve a peaceful mind, the body follows. Yeah. Uh, mindfulness and uh, grounding techniques, it's good to have all the upstream, you know, preventive kind of measures and all that. But uh, also, uh, just to caution, it's always good to seek a professional in terms of uh, supporting your recovery. Mm. Yeah. Okay, talking about your mental health struggles with your loved ones can be helpful. Facts or cap? <laughs> oh, haha, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I was going more, I was going towards um, fat. Facts, yeah. uh, but then I thought, I think about it, I feel that there are certain cases where the family itself is the cause or the source of 
uh, distress for the individuals. If let's say I'm ready to talk to my family about it, but then I know that the family is uh, probably the root of the issue, like um, how would you caution or advise someone to do that? Mm, I think uh, what's really important is to be able to identify the telltale signs of gaslighting. In Asian context, family members, especially the older ones, the way they speak to the um, younger children, it can, it can get very dismissing. But I think beyond just that, it's to really like know your limits and be able to reach out to an alternative form of support. So it not necessarily needs to be their immediate family members like their parents and caregivers. Are there other figures or role models whom they can trust and it's, they are a safe person or a safe space for them to share their struggles or challenges. How do you draw boundaries during such discussion mm. uh, in order to protect your own mental health, to ensure that the conversations are you know, going in a way that is also productive and conducive for yourself? Setting ground rules. Lah. Ground if, rules. Yeah, even before you start, certain things that you feel that you, know, you shouldn't be talking about, what are some of the things that you know it might trigger the person or it might trigger your own past trauma? So how can friends or family create a safe space for people suffering from mental health issues to start sharing? Just be a listener, like you know, just don't judge them, empathize with them. We need more empathy, more love, you know. See what they want, be there for them as much as you can. Don't just brush it off. Then they will just close up and they will not mm. share yeah. with you again. So mm. just be mindful when someone is sharing. Them knowing that there is someone out there supporting them, I think that really, that will really mean a lot to them. Thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, that was a really fruitful discussion about mental health in Singapore. To end off, let's talk about, uh, firstly, how do institutions support youth in their mental health struggles? Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> institutions. MOE is actually having this um, peer support training. MOM, Ministry of Manpower, uh, TAFEP, NTUC uh, is also looking into training, you know, the HR, uh, some of the supervisors in the workplace and the corporates to better support their employees. In terms of families, NCSS, uh, MSF, through the different complementary counselling services. The Agency for Integrated Care under Ministry of Health actually have teams that provide intervention services, like for example, counselling or casework services. And of course, uh, we have the Interagency Task Force for Mental Health and Wellbeing, which is actually supported by the different ministries. Oh, that's very informative. It like, like really... really a lot of institutional <laughs> support. Yeah. If these youths are not going to the organisations that Ming Xiu uh, just mentioned, uh, where do they go? But to really um, just seek advice from someone that you can trust, you feel safe to open up, have a conversation, and then from there, uh, we can see like what is the next step. At least now you know that you are not alone. It's more easier to reach out to their friends, to their peers, and from there, we hope to build this culture amongst the peers to really encourage and like normalise mental health. Hmm. What are your hopes for the future of mental health support in Singapore? My personal hopes would be one day uh, that any Singaporean in distress right, um, will not be fearful to actually go and seek help and that he or she is able to afford it and assess the help in terms of their recovery. I really hope for mental health to be normalised, something that everyone, if you're going for therapy, you, you wouldn't be surprised. You'd be like, hey, I'm also going for therapy as well. Yeah, definitely, like, it should be normalised. Know that you are not alone. Like, I also have my own struggles. Keep striving to find ways to manage it. What's one piece of advice you would give to those um, struggling with mental health? I mean, they say that, you know, a listening ear would actually half your burden. It's always best to actually uh, find someone whom you can trust and to share your struggles. I would like to share this very special quote. Stars still shine in the darkest nights. Even when you can see them, they're always there. Most of us, we go through difficulty, we go through dark periods in our lives, and sometimes it can get really hard to like see the light. But sometimes a reason why you can't see the light is maybe you are the light. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so just really hold on to the light that you have and just know that it will all be okay. Mm. Yeah. Don't expect things to, to be okay just because you consult someone. It takes time to build momentum. How can I manage it? and keep trying and keep taking those small steps and you will eventually get there, right? 
it's been a really enjoyable session. We have come to the end of this episode. Catch us in the next episode of Chatterbox. I'm Nikki, your host, signing off.